Hi, I'm Marion. Welcome to Together. I'm a little, guy, a little caught up in worship there, and uh, for good reason, because uh, Jesus is so good. Um, I want to welcome you. If you've never been to Together, thanks for voting, and thanks for getting here. Awesome. And uh, who is new to Together? By show of hands. Awesome. Welcome back, everyone. And if you haven't been with us before, I just want you to know that we are doing a series right now uh, called Portraits. And we're looking at women of the Bible, and we're looking at our story and God's story through these amazing women and snapshots of their lives. Well, tonight we started with this song. And the song said, I am who you say I am. I want you to think about that for a second. I am who he, who God says I am. And regardless if you recognize or not, all of us, we walk around with a label or we walk around with a name or an identity that we believe about ourselves. Now we've either allowed life circumstances or people to name us and tell us who we are, or we look to our creator and our redeemer and we allow him to tell us who we are. So my prayer tonight is that instead of just singing that song and saying with our mouths, I am who you say I am, my prayer is that tonight, that when we walk out of here in the depths of our being, we would believe, we would believe in the depths of our being who God says we are. Now we all have some names that we carry. Anyone have a nickname from childhood that if you heard it today, it would make you cringe? I've got one, I won't say it because I got people in here who will call me that just to be fun, okay? Uh, but I had a couple of names in childhood. Um, so uh, in Texas, we like to say bless her heart, you know, bless her heart. I um, went through quite the um, challenging stage I look at my three-year-old daughter right now, and she's so pretty, and I'm like, girl, middle school's coming, and it's rough, right? <laughs> middle school's coming, it's rough. And middle school for me meant a couple of things. First of all, I went through puberty, and all of a sudden, my hair went from kind of wavy to curly. And bless my heart, can everyone say bless my heart? Um, no one told me not to brush it. Um, younger girls, let me tell you, we, we, the children of the 80s and the 90s, we grew up before YouTube. We did not have tutorials on how to do this stuff. We did not have a Kardashian teaching us how to contour. We were left on our own with our rave hairspray just to do our best, okay? Um, so about 13 my hair starts growing curly and I brush it and so let me just tell you I have an orbit around my head <laughs> it has its own solar system okay and so I remember getting called names like mop and glow and all these kind of things real fun stuff and then um, bless my heart my teeth decided to do this amazing thing where they crossed over each other and there was a gap but then the gap started crossing and they were coming in sideways super fun so when I would go in the cafeteria in eighth grade the eighth grade boys would circle around me and they would sing the theme song to Mr. Ed now some of you are um, you're old enough to remember I was being called a horse and that was not fun. And you combine that with the fact that I grew like 12 inches in one year and every guy in my zip code was like four foot two and I'm five foot 11. And so I am Buddy the Elf before Buddy the Elf is cool, okay? <laughs> and so we carry these labels and I can remember feeling that shame. I can remember feeling that those people have spoken this over me so therefore I must be ugly. Well, there's the, there's the names that people call us, right? Well, there's also the names we call ourselves. And one of the names I called myself from the littlest, earliest memories up until Jesus redeemed my life was usable. You see, someone had victimized me as a child and when you are victimized as a young woman, you think it's your fault. You think you're the one to blame and you believe a lie from the pit of hell about who you are. And so the label I took on myself was, I am usable. Well, we have voices from outside of us. Maybe your mom or your dad spoke something over you that you were worthless. Maybe it was a coach 
maybe it was a teacher, but we all carry those labels. And then there's the labels we tell ourselves, but we can't forget also that we have an enemy, right? And we have an enemy who came to steal, kill, and destroy, and he's also by Jesus called the accuser. And one of the things our enemy specializes in is condemnation. So we hear voices from people, we hear voices from ourselves, and we hear voices from the enemy. And all of these are doing is heaping names on us that God never intended for us to carry. Now, if you're in this room tonight and you've ever felt shame, by a show of hands, I'm sure a lot of us can write. If you've ever carried a label because of something that you did in your past, Maybe you were that girl in your high school and you've changed since then, but in your high school, people said things about you and you've carried the shame of some things that you did and you've carried it to this day. Maybe you've done some things that you said, I will never, ever, ever do that. And then you did that thing and you've carried condemnation to this day. Well. If any of those things are true, then you can relate to the woman we're going to be talking about tonight. Because not one time, not two times, but every time this woman's name is mentioned in the Bible, she's called a harlot. She's called a prostitute. She's called a woman of evil living. And so tonight, we're going to be looking at Rahab. And if you want to turn in your Bibles, we're going to be in Joshua chapter 1. But as you're turning there, let me just make a couple of points. Rahab was a prostitute, meaning she sold her body to men for sex. Now, I have a little girl right now whose fascination in life is the movie Frozen. She sings and dances, and every morning, the first thing that she wants to do is put on an Elsa costume, and I can't do two braids, because that's Anna. I have to do one braid, because that's Elsa. (laughs) And I can guarantee you, here's not what she's fantasizing about as a little girl. She's not daydreaming of one day becoming a prostitute. So when we look at Rahab's story, here's what I want you to understand. At some point, Rahab was a little girl with little girl dreams. At some point, Rahab had horrific and evil things done to her or forced upon her or withheld from her that led her to become Rahab the harlot. I don't believe there is one woman in this industry today or 8,000 years ago who said, one day I'm going to wake up and I'm going to be a prostitute. That's not how it happens. Amen? And so when we look at her, we have to understand that Rahab has a backstory. And that's going to become very important in a little bit. And Rahab's backstory probably included abuse. Rahab's backstory probably included someone from her family selling her into trafficking. Rahab's backstory probably includes the fact that she was used and abused and she believed that she was nothing more than a harlot. What's interesting, when we look at the Hebrew name Rahab, I did a little research this week and the name Rahab In the Hebrew, it means insolent. Now, I had to go digging a little bit because I had an idea of what insolent mean, but Rahab, the word insolent means brash. It means brazen. It means saucy, like she's gonna give you some attitude. It means disdainful. And what I imagine as I look at her name is that she was probably named because of her attitude. She became what people expected of her. She became how she was treated. I'm sure that little girl who became that woman, in order to protect herself, in order to defend herself, she stuffed that wounded heart deep inside. And so what people saw from the outside was a tough, hard, brazen woman who was going to control her house, who was going to say when, how much she was tough. And they named her that. But what we're going to see in this story 
is not only can God change your destiny, He can change your name. And not only can God change your occupation, He can change who you are and use you in the kingdom of God. We also see that anytime Rahab is mentioned in Scripture, she's called the harlot. Now, there have been some religious men over the past couple hundred years who are like, now that is unbecoming of God's people. We have to, you know, clean up the Bible a little bit. So they tried to go back and find a way to, you know, whitewash this woman's story and go, you know what, she was just an innkeeper. You know, she wasn't really a harlot. She wasn't really a prostitute because how could God use this woman? And so they tried to change it. But if you actually look at the word harlot in Hebrew and Greek, you know what it means? It's the same word where we get pornography. So in that day and in that age, this woman would have been triple X. I don't say that to make us laugh. I say that for us to understand her before story, where she came from, what had been done to her, and the lies that she believed about herself. She believed she was usable, and she believed that she had to be tough to take care of herself, and she was a hard, hard woman. Now let's look at how God enters Rahab's story. If you'll turn into Joshua chapter one, let me give you a little background. I'm about to unload the whole Bible on you, so P.S. just buckle up. So last month we talked about, uh, we talked about Sarah and how God had made a promise to Abraham and he told Abraham that I'm going to make you a great nation and I'm going to bless you and you're going to have all these descendants. And he also told him in Genesis 12 that these descendants, his people would have this land and this blessing. Well, fast forward about 400 years, God was faithful. They have the child and this nation grows into the nation that we call the Hebrew people. Well, P.S., these people go into slavery in Egypt for 400 years. But does that mean God is done with his promise? Oh, no. Oh, no. He is faithful. So he sends a deliverer named Moses to deliver them out of slavery in Egypt. Now, God takes them out in order to take them in to the promised land. So he brings them out. There's this showdown with Pharaoh. He parts the Red Sea. God destroys their enemy. And now they're in the wilderness. Okay. Moses brings them to the precipice of the promised land. Everything that God says he's going to do, God has done. And so Moses sends in 12 spies into the promised land just to, to look at it, to survey the land, to tell him like a general would to find out a strategic report. Well, the 12 spies come back and two of them are like, God's got this. He's going to win the battle. Let's go take it. There were 10 who were like, oh no, there are giants in the land and they're taller than that girl in eighth grade. They are big people. And so the 10, they feared the giants and they said, we're just grasshoppers. We can't go in there. And they didn't believe God. And in that moment, God said, because here's what pleases him is faith. God said, okay, this generation who doesn't believe that I fight your battles, that I've got your back, that I'm gonna keep my promise, this generation, they're gonna die in the wilderness. They're not gonna go into the promised land except for Joshua and Caleb who did believe. And I'm gonna go into, I'm gonna send the next generation in. So 40 years pass, that first unbelieving generation has now died, but Joshua is raised up as the leader after Moses has died. And so we enter into the story in Joshua 1, they're back at the Jordan River. They're back on the precipice of entering the promised land, and God speaks these words to Joshua. Joshua 1, 1 verse 3, God speaks and he says, every place that the sole of your foot will tread, Upon, I have given you just as I promised to Moses from the wilderness in this Lebanon, as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites to the great sea toward the going down of the sun shall be your territory. So here's God speaking. He's declaring what is not yet as it is. This is going to be your land. Verse five, he says, no man 
No matter how tall, no man will be able to stand against you all the days of your life. Just as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you nor forsake you. So I wanted to start there before we get into Rahab's story to know that God is behind the conquest of Canaan. God is behind these people coming in to take the promised land because when we enter into Rahab's story in a minute, they have heard the hoofbeats. They have heard the Israelites coming, and there is a response to this news. Now, let's turn over into Joshua 2, and we're going to see Rahab's story. First, we're going to look at Rahab's faith. Joshua 2, verse 1. And Joshua, the son of Nun, sent two men secretly from Shittim as spies, saying, Go view the land, especially Jericho. And they went and came into the house of a prostitute whose name was Rahab and lodged there. And it was told of the king of Jericho, Behold, men of Israel have come here tonight to search out the land. Then the king of Jericho sent to Rahab, saying, Bring out the men who have come to you, who entered your house, for they have come to search out the land. But the woman had taken the two men and hidden them. And she said, True, the men came to me, but I did not know where they were from. And when the gate was about to be closed at dark, the men went out. I do not know where the men, when men, the men went. Pursue them quickly, for you will overtake them. But she had brought them up to the roof and hid them with the stalks of flax that she had laid in order on the roof. So the men pursued after them on the way to the Jordan as far as the fords. And the gate was shut as soon as um, the pursuers had gone out. So here's what we need to understand. Rahab's house of prostitution was built into the walls of Jericho. Now, as little kids, if you've studied this story or heard about it in Bible study, you understand that God's going to send in his people and they're going to circle around the walls of Jericho. Now, Imagine that inside this great wall, the defensive fortress around the city is the house of Rahab. She lives inside the walls of the house. And so when the, the men come to her, because that's an easy place for two men to come and kind of blend in would be a house of prostitution. So they go to her house and they're trying to act like they're normal visitors. Well, here's the thing, they're really bad spies. Okay, because immediately when they go into Jericho, the king is told, like they're, no, they're not in her house a split second when it reaches the king's ears that the Israelite spies have come into Jericho. Now here's what happens. She takes them in. This woman has audacity, okay? In a day and age where women were considered cattle and property, and they did not have a voice, she takes this most incredible, bold stance, and she takes these men, she puts them on her roof, and they've just been dye, um, drying this flax, and she hides these men under that flax. Now, here comes a knock at the door. Boom, boom, boom. The knock at the door is the king's soldiers. And in that moment, can you imagine her stomach, her throat dropped to her stomach. She was in sheer panic because she's busted, right? Have you ever been busted? Like you've done something, you know it's wrong, and now here you are. Um, I used to be kind of a speed demon. I'm going to be honest, be before Christ, you know, BC, I liked, I, I left everywhere late and so I would have to drive like 90 miles an hour to make up the time. Um, and so I got a lot of tickets between 16 to 24. I'm just saying, you know, before Jesus, I was a hot mess. And so one time I was driving back and forth to college. Y'all are all gonna just never look at me in the eye again after the story. <laughs> I was driving back and forth to college, and I went through this small town in East Texas, and I was going like 85 and a 40, and I got pulled over by the cops like, what? Why would you pull me over, you know? And so I get a ticket, um, six months passed by, I thought, well, I'll just never drive to that town again, I don't want to pay the $200. And so about six months later, I was driving back through that little small town, because of stupid that I am, and I was going about... 55 and a 40. Slow down a little bit. And I crest over this hill 
and I see the lights behind me. And you know when you've tried to put something out of your mind, like this is not happening, and then you see the lights in your rearview mirror, and I'm like, there's probably an unpaid ticket in this city. I pull over, and the, ma- the words, ma'am, you're gonna need to get out of the car, you're under arrest, came out of the cop's mouth, and I was 19 years old. <laughs> and I went to jail in a small East Texas town for an unpaid parking ticket. And let me tell you ladies, every time I go over the speed limit and I see a cop, I have PTSD to this day, all I'm saying. (laughs) So when I imagine Rahab who's just hidden these, these, not cops, she didn't hide the cops, she's hidden the spies up on her roof and she hears the king's knock on the door, she's like, I'm busted. I'm so busted. And she goes to the front door and she's like, spies, what spies? I don't know what you're talking about. They've gone. Oh, they were here. They go. Those guys, they left. And so she covers for them. But why does she do this? Why does she put her life at risk? Why does she go out? We're about to find out why this woman who's called brash and brazen, who's called insolent, who's been named every name in the book, who's only been used for her body. We're going to find out in just a minute why she made this bold move. uh, Joshua 8, Joshua 2 verse 8 says this, before the men lay down, Rahab came up to them on the roof and said to the man, I know that the Lord has given you the land and that the fear of you has fallen upon us and all that happened in this land melt away because of you. For we have heard, everyone say we have heard. We have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea before you when you came out of Egypt and what you did to the two kings, the Amorites who were beyond the Jordan of Sihon and Og, whom you devoted to destruction. And as soon as we heard it in our hearts melted and there was no spirit left in any man because of you. Why? For the Lord your God. He is God in the heavens above and on the earth beneath. Now then, please swear to me by the Lord. She calls on the covenant name of God. Please swear to me by the Lord that as I have dealt kindly with you, you will also deal kindly with my father's house and give me a sure sign that you will save alive my father's mother, my brothers and sisters and all who belong to them and deliver. Everyone say deliver and deliver our lives from death. And the men said to her, our life for yours, even to death. If you do not tell this business of ours, then when the Lord gives us this land, notice their confidence, when the Lord gives us this land, we will deal kindly and faithfully with you. Here's why Rahab took such a risk. Because Rahab believed in the God of Israel. Now, sometimes when we say believe, we think of an intellectual thing. We think, oh yeah, I believe that event happened. But in this case, believe means faith that was followed by action. Her faith looked at the scenario. And what I want you to understand is this was not a land. Jericho was not a land that wasn't religious. These people were very religious, but here's what their religion looked like. They would take a piece of stone or a piece of gold or a piece of wood and they would carve an image into it and they would go set up that image in a temple. This is called idolatry. And they would worship that God. And they believed that their gods were localized to their area. So the God of Jericho, they believed, would defend Jericho. Well, here's the problem. Their God required sacrifices. And the sacrifices they made, would they would take babies and they would throw them into the fire as an act of worship to this thing they had carved with their hands. And I just wonder, as a woman who was a prostitute, how many babies that she had to throw into that fire. And they didn't just do that. What they called worship was taking little girls and as the age of nine and 10 and making those little girls become cult prostitutes. 
so that the men of their city could come and worship by having sex with little girls. And I wonder if Rahab's story starts because someone sold her to be a cult prostitute. And when they were done with her, she believed, I'm just usable. And she set up shop in the walls of Jericho. So when Rahab hears the stories of what happened, that the God of the Israelites, he doesn't take life, he makes life. The God of the Israelites, he doesn't kill his people, he defends his people. The God of the Hebrews, he fights their battles, he doesn't kill their babies. And so when she began to hear the story of how the God of the Hebrews defended his people against the Pharaoh of Egypt, the most powerful man in the world and who reigns supreme, not some general, but the Lord God Almighty reigns supreme. And so this news begins to travel all over the known world of what happened when the Lord showed off for his people. And they knew that the God of Israel said, that's your land. So when they begin to hear the message, the Hebrews are coming. Well, some people, they heard it and they didn't believe. And some people heard and said, well, I'm going with the God of the Hebrews. And that one woman's name was Rahab. She weighed her options. These so-called gods that we've made with our hands, that steal our babies, that steal our lives, that kill us, are the God who, what did she describe in him? The Lord God of both heaven and earth who creates all things. The revelation that this woman understood about the greatness of our God is mind-boggling. So she sticks her necks out on the line because she's like, I've looked at the end result here, and I'm going to go with the one who's going to win. Amen? And so Rahab decides that she's going to go with the God of Israel. And I want you to calculate this for a minute. Forty years prior to that, there were ten spies who looked at Moses and said, there are giants in the land, and we can't take it. And there was one prostitute who stood up and said, you've got a giant God who's about to defeat this darkness. And you know what pleases him? He didn't care about Rahab's past. He didn't care. I mean, he cared about what was done to her. But in that moment, the one who stood up and said, I believe you, God, that's what pleased him. That's what moved her from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. And that's what happens to us. See, what Rahab did was she heard the message and then she combined hearing with faith. Ephesians 1 says this, and you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, When you believed, you were marked in him with a seal. Everyone say seal. The promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. So what the book of Ephesians tells us is that at some point, we all hear the message of God, that God came to deliver us. He came to defeat our enemy, which is sin and death. And when we hear that, and we don't just hear it, but we combine it with faith and say, I'm going with that God, we do exactly what Rahab did. We go from darkness to light. And it's the hearing and the believing that welcomes us into the kingdom of God. Romans 10, 9 says it this way, It says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, pause, what did Rahab do? She stood before the Hebrew spies and she confessed, your God is the God of the universe. There is no other. And your God is about to take these people out. That's confessing with your mouth. 
Romans 10, 9 says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, what happens? You will be saved. Do you have to go clean yourself up? Find some church lady clothes? Stop cussing? No, the Bible says, if you believe with your heart and confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, you are saved. Well, you say, well, that's too good to be true. It absolutely is. It absolutely is too good to be true. All these people who are ticked off that Kanye has been redeemed. (laughs) They're like, he's a misogynist. He's written words about women. I'm like, and this is God's specialty. I mean, have you not read the Bible? This is what God does. He takes murderers. He takes, this is for his glory is to take the broken, the damaged, the lost, the ones that the world said it's too much and resurrect the dead. Amen. This is what God does. But here's what I want to show you. There is evidence in Rahab that she had saving faith. You know, I told you at the beginning, her name meant insolent. Her name meant brash, hard. You know, you could just see her out there at the door of her brothel, just tough. But Rahab went from insolent to compassionate. When she requested the spies to save her. She didn't just say, hey, I'm going to be hiding over here. And when all this goes down, y'all come get me. You know what Rahab said? She goes, please rescue my family, my mother, my father, my sisters, my brothers. And you know what I imagine? Those are the same people who sold her into trafficking. These are the people who abused her and did not come for her, and her heart weeps for them. So you want to know if someone's born again, do they have the heart of Jesus? Because there's no way, there's no way on her own, apart from the Spirit of God in her, that she could get a flip about those people. But when she's making the escape plan, the compassionate heart of God to rescue the lost fills her up and says, Please rescue my dad. Please rescue my mom. Please rescue my sister. Please rescue my brothers. Please. And so we see that genuine saving faith is evidenced by love and grace for other people, even those who've hurt us. When God begins to work in your heart and you see the mercy and grace he's given you, There's a natural overflow to give that mercy and grace to other people. And I bet Rahab began to see, you know, she began to see the darkness of the world. She began to see the enemy who had worked to cause all of the destruction. And she she understood that all those people needed rescuing just as much as she did. So here we get to the heart of the story. Go back to Joshua 2, verse 15. Then she let them down by a rope through the window, for her house was built in the city wall, so that she lived in the wall. And she said to them, go into the hills, or the pursuers will encounter you, and hide there three days until the pursuers have returned. Then afterward you may go your way. And the men said to her, we will be guiltless with respect to this oath of yours that you have made us swear. Behold, when we come into the land, you shall tie this scarlet cord in the window through which you let us down. And you shall gather into your house your father and mother, your brothers, and all your father's household. Then if anyone goes out of the doors of your house into the street, his blood shall be his own head, and we shall be guiltless. But if a hand is laid on anyone who is with you in the house, his blood shall be on our head. But if you tell this business of ours, then we shall be guiltless with respect to your oath that you have made us swear. And she said, according to your words, so be it. 
Then she sent them away and departed, and she tied the scarlet cord in the window. They departed and went into the hills and remained there three days until the pursuers returned, and the pursuers searched all along the way and found nothing. Then the two men returned, and they came down from the hills and passed over and came to Joshua the son of Nun, and they told him all that had happened to them. And they said to Joshua, truly, the Lord has given us all the land in our hands, and also the inhabitants of the land melt away because of us. If you want to understand the whole Bible, I want you to look at this scarlet cord. When Joshua spies put this in Rahab's hands, I believe prophetically they were looking back and prophetically they were looking forward. See in the Bible there's always a scarlet thread of redemption. Now, if you're new to church, that word redemption means to buy something back. It means to restore it to its original intent. And in God's economy, redemption happened when an animal, a lamb, was spilled out and the blood of that animal was poured out to atone for the sins of that person. Instead of that person dying, just like the pagan idolatry did, the lamb would die in the place of that person. So this scarlet thread looked back at the Passover that 40 years before those Israelites came out of Egypt because the blood of the lamb was on the doorpost and they were covered under the blood of the lamb. So as they handed her the scarlet cord, they said, we want you under the blood. Put this on your window, put this on your door. And when we come, we'll see that and your family will be delivered. And once they delivered, because you're under the scarlet cord. But this also looked forward. It prophetically looked forward to the cross of Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God who was ordained before the foundation of the world, who would come and his blood would be spilled out and so that we can enter into Christ and be under the blood of the Lamb and we're delivered from death, we're delivered from sin and we're rescued from our enemy. So on her window, she hung the scarlet cord. And this is a picture that we see all throughout the Bible. And we see that this is why this woman, this woman who is called a prostitute and a harlot, every time she's mentioned, is one of the two women in the hall of faith in Hebrews 11. Because she took that scarlet cord and she didn't just believe it with her head. She's like, I'm redecorating my house. And she put it out. I don't care if the king sees it. Because I know the king of glory sees it. And she put out that scarlet cord and then they waited. Genesis, Joshua 6 tells us about Rahab's redemption. I'm going to hurry through this, but if you want to look at this story, God's game plan for defeating his enemy and delivering his people was weird. It is not what we would say was a good battle strategy. He told Joshua, I want you to take the worship team and we're going to take the priest and the worship team and we're going to circle Jericho for seven days. And not a sound was uttered, not a cannon was blasted, not a bow was shot. The worshipers walked around Jericho for seven days. And on the seventh day, they walked around seven times. And at the end, they shouted a shout of victory. Because it was already done. You know why? Because God had already said it. So they shouted a shout of victory, and you know what happened? The walls fell down. All of those people crushed, defeated by the throne of heaven destroyed it, except one part of the wall. Hear me say this. One portion of the wall stood, and it was the house of Rahab. Did she earn it? Was she a perfect, good, Christian little girl? Oh, heck no, Uh uh-uh. 
but she was under the blood of the lamb. And what delivered her from death to life was faith. What delivered her from death to life was faith. And so the walls of Jericho fell. God's army rushed in and they took the city. And as they promised, they went and delivered out Rahab and her father and her mother, her brothers and her sisters and all who by faith, everyone say by faith, all who by faith had entered in. Our God is so good. I want to tell us Here's what Rahab teaches us about the Lord. And I feel like this is holy ground because someone in this room so desperately needs to know this right now. Here's what Rahab teaches us. There is no sin that you've done or that's been done to you that can keep you from the grace of Jesus Christ. There is no sin that you've done or that's been done to you that can keep you from the grace of Jesus Christ. The only unpardonable sin is unbelief. That's it. But I've had five abortions. Well, let's, how about we tell the accuser to be gone and let's stand under the blood of the lamb. But I did the thing I never said I would do. Well, you know what? That's what God's grace is so amazing. Ladies, redemption is what God does. And redeemer is who Jesus is. And I want you to imagine that 2,000 years ago, when Jesus went to the cross, fulfilling the scarlet thread of redemption that weaves throughout the Bible, and it was real blood coming from his hands, real blood coming from his feet, real blood crushing through that crown of thorns, that scripture says he saw you and that he said that you were worth dying for. That you were worth dying for. Here's what Rahab teaches us about the Lord. When God redeems you, he changes your identity. Someone say hallelujah to that because y'all are way too quiet. When God redeems you, he changes your identity. If you didn't know, the name of my ministry is Redeemed Girl. And people are like, why do you call yourself a girl? Because Jesus looked at that little girl and said, I'm going to make you someone new. Rahab's name was always called the harlot. Or another word we would use is prostitute. You know what's so amazing? is Rahab would come out of Jericho where she had been used and abused and defiled and she entered the family of God. And you know what she became? She married a man named Solomon who was a prince of the Hebrew people. He was of the clan and tribe of Judah who the king was to come from. Rahab went from prostitute to princess. I can't make this stuff up. <laughs> and so when we come to Jesus, here's what he says and declares over us. You are not that girl anymore. You are not what was done to you. You are not what you've chosen to do. You are not what the world has labeled you. You are not the sin that you've done. You are who I say you am. What? 
<laughs> Y'all understand what I mean. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Um, but when God redeems you, he changes your identity. He calls you daughter. He calls you beloved. He calls you forgiven. He calls you chosen. He calls you clean. He changes your identity. But here's the thing. He doesn't just change your identity. When God redeems you, he changes your destiny. What I love about Rahab's story is she did not come out of deliverance from destruction and set up another brothel. Can I get an amen? amen. She married. And some good godly man said, yeah, I'm going to marry you. I know your past, but God redeemed you. Amen. Someone needs to know that. He changed her destiny. She became a princess of the Hebrew people. She had a son. Get this. Her son was Boaz. If you know anything about the Bible, we all lift Boaz up as like, there is hope for a good man in the world. This former prostitute and harlot raised the mo one of the most godly men in the Bible. You want to tell me her faith wasn't just intellectual? It changed everything. She from, went from insolent to compassion. She went from insolent to mother and nurturer. He redeems your destiny. Well, Boaz married a woman named Ruth, and they had some kids, and Ruth became the grandmother of King David. You heard of him? Wrote a lot of the Bible. His great-grandma was Rahab. <laughs> Fast forward. This woman who's been labeled and shamed and named our Redeemer was not ashamed to call uh, her his great-great-grandma. Matthew chapter 1, when we look at the genealogy of Jesus Christ, proving that he was the King of kings and Lord of lords, that went all the way back to King David. They did his genealogy, and it says, Salmon, the father of Boaz, whose mother was Rahab. Boaz, the father of Obed, whose mother was Ruth, and Obed, the father of Jesse, and Jesse, the father of King David. So when the holy word of God begins to list the lineage of our Savior, it is not a shame to say God redeemed that girl and used her story for his glory. And here's what I want you to know. He's going to do the same for you. And he delights in it. Amen. Whatever's going on down there, amen, Misty. <laughs> My friends, the ushers are going to pass forward right now. And I'm going to work on my grammar real quick. And we're, we're going to declare, I am who he says I am. You're about to get one of these scarlet cords of redemption. And here's what I want you to do. I want you to wear it for the next month. And I want you to put this around your wrist because there's a scripture in Isaiah and it says, one will write on his hand, I belong to the Lord's, I am his. And you're prophetically lifting up your hand and saying, I am redeemed. I don't care what this person has labeled me. I don't care what the enemy wants to shame me with. I don't care what the voice in my head says. I'm gonna believe who God says I am. So as the ushers, Pass these forward. I want you to put it on. And as we enter into worship right now, this song is amazing because it's going to say, I will rise and stand redeemed. And I want you to prophetically declare over your life, I am who he says I am. I will be who God says I will be. And let's go into worship. Well, I would be remiss um, if I let us leave this place and not offer someone in this room the opportunity to say, just as I am, 
Jesus, I come. And I want you to know, here's what the gospel, the good news is. In your brokenness, in your sin, in your mess, Jesus died for you. And you, by faith, believe that. That means you put your hope and confidence in Christ as your Savior, not religion, not your perfection. And in that moment, you come from death to life by faith. And I'm going to say a simple prayer. This prayer is not a magic formula. The prayer is an acknowledgement of dependence. And if you want to begin a relationship with Christ, you just silently to yourself say, Jesus, I come. So let's all close our eyes. (sighs) Jesus, I come. Say that with me. (sighs) Nothing do I bring. I confess I'm broken. I confess I'm a sinner. But I confess that you are a savior. I put my faith in you, Jesus. I trust you, Jesus. You are my redeemer. And I am who you say I am. 